Hello, welcome and good evening once again. In today's tutorials, we are going to talk about the inspection of the valve as well as the abnormalities which we may find upon inspection of the valve. If this is the first time you are watching this channel, I would advise that you go back to the previous uh, video and watch uh, the detailed explanation of the anatomy of the female external genitalia. However, over here, we shall only review something small about the anatomy. And so, like we said in the first video, we have this to be the labia majora, then this being the labia minora, and as we said, the labia minor moves anteriorly to form or divides into two folds, the prepuce and the frenulum. Uh, and in between them, you have the clitoris. Then we may have the urethra orifice, and beside it, we shall have the skinless duct over here. And the lower two thirds of the vestibule is where we have the vagina orifice or the interitus occupying and at the lower ends of the interitus we shall also have the Bartholomew's gland as well as the fortune. Now over here we have the anatomy as well as the blood supply to the vulva and also parts of the perineal area and so over here we have the inferior rectal artery then the internal pudenda artery which is also a branch of the femoral artery then we have the perineal artery also over here then over here we have the deep transverse uh, perineal muscle and on top of it we shall have an artery which is supplying the vestibular bulb and also we shall have the deep artery of the clitoris these structures are very important since they contribute uh, immensely towards uh, the disease states that we are going to uh, talk about in this tutorial. Now, when we examine the vulva, or when must we examine the vulva? You see, it's a very important that we inspect the vulva during ab abdominal palpation and also during vagina examination. Uh, this could be done either during the antenatal period, during labor, or even during or you know, following uh, childbirth. This is because when we do this, we shall be able to identify any uh, conditions which are affecting the vulva, and uh, prompt measures can also be uh, you know, given to such conditions. And so over here, we have some abnormalities which may be found there are a lot of them but uh, we just outline these simple and few ones for the meantime so we may find parietos vulva we also find uh, the vulva hematoma we may also have the vulva what the vulva swollen the varicose veins of uh, the vulva and also vulva sores or herpes genitalis or the vulva edema uh, basically, we are going to talk about uh, two of them in this video, and the subsequent ones will be followed uh, up in the uh, new videos which are yet to come. So, straight away, let's look at the first one, which is the pruritus valva, and it's a sensation of itch in the valva, and uh, usually uh, women who have these. Uh, complaints attempt to gain some relief by scratching and so it's always uncomfortable uh, for them we may also uh, need to differentiate or distinguish between vulva pain uh, from the from the itch as well as from vulvodynia which refers to the chronic burning symptoms in the absence of any clinical signs however uh, it is important to note that uh, the vulva itch pain and burning uh, sensation may all coexist uh, in a particular uh, you know, uh, incidence. So, what are some of the causes of these uh, pruritus vulva? We have a lot of them uh, due to infection, 
inflammatory skin conditions, neoplasias, and also uh, as a result of uh, neuropathy. And uh, infections, which are common when we talk about vulvar pruritus, include uh, vulvo vaginal trash. And this is the most important microorganism to consider in a post pubertal uh, woman who is complaining of uh, vagina or vulva itch. There may also be bacterial vaginosis. I mean, this bacterial vaginosis, usually you may have uh, this uh, frothy malodorous discharge coming from either the vagina or from uh, the vulva. There may also be infections uh, from genital viral warts and so on. We may also have uh, infections or we may also have uh, uh, itchy vulva from uh, inflammatory skin conditions and the most common one is the irritant contact dermatitis and the others may include psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis, allergic contact dermatitis and uh, folliculitis. There are a lot of them but these are the uh, most important ones which uh, I came across. We may also have uh, itchy vulva due to neoplasias and the most common uh, cancerous lesion which may cause an itchy vulva uh, it will be the squamous intraepithelial lesion which is also known as the vulva intraepithelial neoplasia simply put we have the vin and also sometimes we have uh, invasive vulva uh, cancers which is typically a squamous uh, cell carcinoma all of these may cause uh, itchiness of the vulva then when we talk about neuropathy, it can also cause uh, pruritus vulva and uh, usually it may be due to uh, an injury, sometimes uh, post-surgery and also sometimes uh, local disease of the vulva such as entrapment of the pudenda uh, nerve uh, within the pelvis or inside uh, the spine. Sometimes also you may have a severe vulva it's which may be due to uh, lesion simplex, also lesion uh, sclerosis, and sometimes also from glycosuria, and also from uh, monolysis infection. And so um, when we are talking about the diagnosis, we shall see that uh, testing the woman for uh, diabetes uh, mellitus or checking the blood sugar levels will be a differential diagnosis. Very, very important to rule out any possible cause of uh, diabetes uh, in this one because women with uh, diabetes usually have, uh, you know, uh, pruritus uh, vulva. In pregnancy, we may also have uh, causes such as vulva engorgement, increased vagina uh, discharge, also contributing to this itchiness of the vulva. Uh, Pruritus vulva uh, may affect all women uh, of all ages at, at least uh, once in their lifetime. And uh, the symptoms basically include the itchiness of the area and also you may find erythema and swelling. And so uh, I brought these photographs to show you some of the real incidents or cases of uh, pruritus vulva. Over here you can see uh, erythema of the vulva folds and over here in the second uh, diagram you can see that due to itchiness of the area you, you know the woman has been scratching and you can see some explorations some scratching marks all over the place and similar you know uh, picture also have the same uh, uh, itchiness and scratching of the place in the third diagram as well. So on physical examination, you, you, you see redness of the area and like we've already uh, described, the scratch marks will be there. Sometimes also you may find discharges from the vulva as well as the vagina and uh, you may also see, you know, uh, the, the, the scratching uh, resulting in some you know, uh, skin infections like we've seen already. So how do you diagnose vulva pruritus or pruritic uh, vulva? Uh, basically the history may also uh, play a very important role and uh, 
examination of the valve will also uh, help us to identify uh, the type of condition that we are dealing with and also bacteria and valve bacteria and viral swaps of the area may also help us to identify the cause of the pruritus and sometimes also we take biopsies to identify uh, the organisms which are causing uh, these uh, itchiness then like i said earlier on the glucose level of the woman should be checked because you know um when we check the glucose level and possibly the glycated hemoglobin we will be able to identify whether this woman may be having diabetes mellitus which uh, is also causing this uh, glucosuria and also leading to this uh, itchiness of the vulva now when we are talking about the diagnosis uh, i want us to focus on some important or specific uh, informations over here when the woman uh, upon physical examination complains or even gives uh, complaints that the itchiness is found on the convex areas and also the ties uh, your your attention must be drawn to irritant contact uh, dermatitis which may be due to urinary incontinence and usually in these uh, cases the itchiness may be symmetrical and sometimes if it's due to allergic contact dermatitis you may find it uh, asymmetrical also if the itchiness is uh, around the flexes you may be thinking of seborrheic dermatitis and also uh, candida in territorial then uh, if uh, the woman complains only of itchiness of the mom's pubis then uh, you may be thinking of folliculitis yeah, this is when the hair follicles in the uh, mom's pubis uh, get infected or even seborrheic dermatitis also if the itchiness is in the labia majora you may be thinking of genital psoriasis atopic dermatitis or uh, even uh, lesion uh, simplex in lesions uh, simplex the itchiness may be either unilateral or bilateral then when there is itchiness of the labia uh, minora, you may be suspecting the lesion sclerosis, which is an inflammatory dermatosis of unknown cause. Uh, some other authorities say it has uh, an autoimmune origin, and uh, it usually affects the genital uh, areas. You may also have uh, uh, itchiness of the intritus or the vagina. Orifice. And if this is the only place where the itchiness is, then you may be thinking of erosive uh, lesion planus, atrophic vulvovaginitis, vaginitis, also vagina discharge, uh, which may also increase during uh, pregnancy, the leucoria, and also in infection can also cause these um, itchiness. And if uh, the itchiness is also around the perineum, uh, specifically, then you'll be thinking about dermatitis and also uh, lesion sclerosis. So these are basically uh, how to differentiate between the various presentation of the vulva edges. And based on this, it will give you uh, a guide as to how to you know, manage uh, such uh, a patient. So <clears throat> how do we treat this uh, vulva pruritus basically uh, we treat uh, for infections we are going to uh, give some topical and oral antifungal agents then uh, we can also give uh, some antibiotics or antiviral medications such as the acyclovir that is basically for the infection if the the cause of the pruritus is as a result of an infection. Now, if it is due to an inflammatory disease, we may want to give topical steroids. And also, if uh, it's as a result of contact uh, urticaria, you may also want to give some oral antihistamines to help reduce uh, the itchiness of the area. We may reserve surgery for the neoplasias. And also, we may also give uh, some tricyclic antidepressant uh, such as glohexitan and also some anticonvulsants such as pregabalin for the neuropathic symptoms. 
Now, it is very important that we encourage and advise uh, the young, you know, pre and even post uh, ladies to ensure uh, good perennial hygiene. And uh, it's very important that we tell them and educate them as to how to clean uh, the vulva, to basically, you know, wiping uh, front to back after bowel movement and also after voiding. Now, the next one that we are going to look at is the vulva hematoma. The vulva hematoma uh, is basically bleeding into the subcutaneous tissue of the vulva or uh, the vaginal wall. It's usually caused by rupture of the blood vessels either spontaneously or after improper repair of perineal tear or an episiotomy wound. And uh, instrumental deliveries also play a major role uh, in the uh, cause of these vulva uh, hematoma. Now, uh, when we look at the anatomy, you will see that in this diagram, uh, we have two forms of these vulva hematoma. Uh, it can either be uh, supralevator hematoma or infralevator hematoma. When we say supralevator hematoma, what we mean is the hematoma or the accumulation of the blood, it's above the levator animals, as you can see in the first diagram over here. You see accumulation of blood on top of the muzzle which is the levator and the muscle. Then we also have the infralevator uh, hematoma, which is also the uh, accumulation of blood below the muscle, which is the elevator uh, and the muscle. This is what is shown in the first uh, diagram. Now, infralevator hematomas may include those of the vulva, the perineum, as well as the paravagina hematomas, and, uh, and those also uh, occurring in the ischio fossa. And uh, it is very important uh, to note that vulva hematomas are more common with instrumental deliveries. Uh, and in this case, forceps delivery uh, and also vacuum aspirations uh, you know, play a major role in causing uh, these hematomas in women. So, what uh, is the incidence of these uh, vulva hematoma? Classically, uh, an acceptable definition of this will be any hematoma which is more than four centimeters in, in, uh, in diameter and so when we look at this definition then the incidence of vulva hematoma will be approximately one in every thousand you know births or in one in every thousand deliveries and uh, uh, you know like i've already said it's usually you know, related to episiotomy. But overall, half of the women who deliver, uh, you know, who deliver uh, post, uh, you know, or have spontaneous uh, vagina uh, deliveries uh, will also have uh, these uh, kind of hematomas developing. So what are the symptoms? Like you, you can see in the second diagram, uh, you can see some swelling of the vulva the you know area and this is accumulation of blood like that over there and this is a typical example of vulva hematoma over here in the third diagram also you can see an accumulation of blood in near the perineum and also near the vulva so symptomatically the woman will uh, complain of severe pain which is you know more or which is usually experienced when the woman tries to sit uh, and this pain is usually unrelieved with analgesics and sometimes they even have very difficulty in passing you and in a very severe state you have these women even going into shock and in this case, you realize that what happens is that they've bled more and it's consumed. And so they may easily, you know, fall into shock. Uh, the swelling, you know, usually is tense and tender to touch. And it keeps increasing, you know, in size. It keeps increasing in size. Yeah. 
on uh, on physical examination what you usually see is that the swelling will be increasing that is if there is still an open artery which is big you may see that the, the the swelling keeps increasing in size and it keeps getting painful also the woman may also uh, be experiencing some uh, rectal pressure and upon examination you also see that because of the accumulation of the blood you see the site to be purplish or blackish in, in color in this these are typical signs of vulva hematoma so uh, i'll stress on it you see that there is increasing swelling on one side of the vagina uh, the swelling may be tense and tend not to touch and because of the accumulation of the blood at that area for a long time the skin will turn purplish and also uh, blackish in color now basically uh, diagnosis may be uh, based on clinical manifestation when you see such a thing so how do we manage vulva hematoma if you get one in addition to resuscitative uh, measures surgical evacuation of the hematoma uh, should be done now an important thing we need to note over here is that resuscitation is very very important and so in a woman who has been you know bleeding like this and you know, sustain such a hematoma you may want to set up quickly your iv fluids give your crystalloids such as the normal saline and the ringus lactate you also have to monitor the vital signs uh, the blood pressure the pulse keep an spo2 to monitor the oxygen saturation and also the respiratory uh, rate of this woman is very very important for you to you know uh, monitor then you also have to look at uh, the pain management which we are going to talk more about over here however if the hematoma is less than five centimeters in diameter and not expanding most of the treatments uh, will simply recommend observation using ice packs and also pressure dressing to limit the hematoma from expanding then you give appropriate analgesia to the woman to reduce uh, the pain however you have to make some markings on the skin so that if the hematoma is expanding you know that there is still a bleeder inside which may necessitate evacuation by surgical means and so you make a, a peripheral you know, skin markings on the margins of the hematoma so that if it's expanding you know and so for hematomas which uh, is more than five centimeters in diameter or hematomas which are rapidly expanding you may have to surgically you know, uh, uh, excise it and uh, you know, evacuate the hematoma. So basically, what uh, we do is we make an incision at the most distended point of the hematoma. Then you scoop out the blood. You make sure you find all the bleeders. Find the bleeders and you know tie them up. Then you suture up the incision or leave it open. Now uh, the 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 recommendation here is that sometimes some obstetricians will recommend that you switch up the incision the reason why they do this is to promote you know faster healing and also to reduce the risk of infection of the wound however some also uh, advise that you leave the wound open especially if it's a very large hematoma and they advise that it's usually benefits from leaving the wound open now wounds which are left open usually heal by secondary intention and so you realize that uh, you may have some scar forming uh, which cosmetically may not be nice and so uh, most people do not advise on this also uh, when you leave the wound open like that the, 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 the possibility of it getting infected is very high especially uh, taking into consideration its proximity 
to the inner area and also if the woman's uh, you know, personal hygiene is not so high the, the chances of you infecting the wound is very high if you leave it open and so either of them has its own merits and demerits and so uh, based on the circumstance in which you find yourself you can choose uh, the one which you think is most appropriate however whether you suture the uh, whether you suture the incision or you leave it open you must leave a drain now when you leave the drain the idea is that you are you know monitoring and observing any fluid or discharges which are coming out from the uh, from the wound now if after 24 hours you see that the drain or the drainage bag is clear you can remove the drain or if after 24 hours you still find bright red blood inside the drain or in the drain bag then it gives you an information that there is still uh, a bleeder which you may have to go back open up the suture and also you know uh, uh, look for it and tie it up before you close it again and so it's very very important to leave a drain to help you uh, to uh, you know, identify any post uh, surgical um, complications now uh, after doing this you basically have to give some antibiotics uh, to reduce risk of infection and you also have to give some analgesias to reduce the pain and you have to give or uh, you know have a close uh, uh, observation of this woman uh, since most of these uh, women may easily go into shock if they have not you know, uh, you know entered into shock uh, post you know, bleeding now it's also very important that as part of management you can also give some blood transfusion to these uh, women when you think that they bled enough you know post uh, delivery and uh, as a matter of rule you know that uh, any uh, blood loss which is more than which is more than 500 mils post delivery should be counted as uh, what uh, uh, postpartum hemorrhage and so the necessary interventions needs to be undertaken so this brings us to the end of today's tutorial thank you very much